There's a handful of videos on this channel where I said, I don't know if I'll ever make that one. Well, guys, today is a day for one of those. Let's talk about my top 10 books of all time. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another top 10 video. This time, guys, it is the one that I have put off for the longest time that, of course, is my top 10 books of all time. Now, I want to kind of get it out of the way here up front. This is as of 2023, meaning today. So I don't know when you'll be watching this, but if you're watching at a certain time, I might have read other things. I might not. And if uh, I don't mention your favorite book, guys, I might not have read it. That's always something that I see on these. But these lists usually do become more about what you've left off than what you have on. Now look guys, this is the best of the best. So out of the hundreds to thousands of books I've read in my life, you know, some things are just gonna have to be left off because we're just gonna only narrow it down to 10 here. Now there are a couple of rules, and I know these are some things that some people have problems with, but they are my rules, no duplicates from the same author. That's because I say I don't wanna make a top 10 list and four of the 10 books are Stephen King books. But guys, for me, it's pretty easy to do that because the only author on here that would have more than one book is Stephen King, and I'm fine only having one Stephen King book on here. Uh, series do not count as one book. But like that's the big cheat. A lot of people will be like, hey, The Wheel of Time is one of my five favorite books of all time. No, we are not going to be doing that. We are going to be talking about just standalone books. Now, it can be part of a series, but it can only be one book in that series. And again, guys, no honorable mentions because I feel like I would be here for so, so long if I did my honorable mention. So let's just dive right into it, guys. Let's talk about number 10 here. Read this one rather recently. This is Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. The reason that I say it's only number 10, guys, is because I always say legacy takes time. I just finished reading this about three weeks ago, and I don't think it is like recency bias or a knee jerk to put it on my top 10 books, because I could say there are not 10 more books better than this that I've read in my life. I think that's easy to say. Putting it like in my top five, I feel like that might be a little bit of recency bias. So this is going to be one of those things. I'm going to let it cook. I think over time, it'll probably be down there closer to my top five books for sure. But as of right now, I say, like I said, legacy takes time. You start to get a clear head about things. You start to think a little bit more. But about uh, Lonesome Dove, guys, this is an absolutely incredible book. I did a review on the channel recently. I think this is just maybe the best character book that I've ever read in my life. And I am a character first guy. And when you've got characters as legendary as Gus and Call, you just got an amazing, amazing cast in here. Every single character matters. You will love or love to hate every single character. No one ever feels like a throwaway. And you just want to go on this journey and spend this time with these cowboys on this trail ride from Texas all the way up to Montana. Just an absolutely amazing, amazing journey that I could not get enough of. It was easy, easy spot in my top 10 here. And like I said, I feel like over time, the legacy on that one, the arrow is gonna be pointing up and that's gonna be raising in these rankings here. But as of now, right now, this moment, June, is it June? June of 2023, it is number 10 all time for me with a big, big green arrow. Number nine, guys, the first sci-fi offering on the list. This is Hyperion by Dan Simmons. This one I read a couple years ago and I was absolutely blown away. This is one that I had put off for a long time. A long time I had wanted to read this. I saw the original cover with the Shrike, you know, watching the Sea of Grass. It was absolutely a stunning cover. And honestly, that was what made me want to read it. I was always curious about it for that reason. For whatever, whenever time went by, I just, I just kind of forgot about it. And when I started doing this channel, I started getting a lot of people be like, hey, have you read Hyperion? I'm like, oh my God, I forgot all about it. I definitely want to. And I read it a couple years ago. Absolutely blew me away, guys. I'd say it's probably my number three sci-fi book of all time. It's so, so good. And I think that what makes it so special is it is very Canterbury Tales in a sci-fi format where you've got, you know, six or seven different versions of this one story leading up to this pilgrimage. And every story just continues to just be more amazing than the previous one. And there are some that will make you laugh. They'll make you cry. They'll make you do all the above. There's some real, real deep things in here. Very thought-provoking in that regard. And there are things that will make you feel uh, the, the, the pain right here. Uh, you know, if you got kids or not, there's some things that might hurt you a little bit. So it's absolutely lightning in a bottle what Dan Simmons did with this because I don't feel like he was able to replicate it in Fall of Hyperion. But I think with this book, just absolutely just a pillar of the sci-fi community. It's not just for the best sci-fi books ever, guys. It's one of the best books ever. I say pick it up, regardless of if you are into science fiction or a lot. You'll find a lot to take away from it. Number 
H is going to be one of my favorite authors ever. And you knew he was going to have a book on here, guys. I'm talking about Michael Crichton, and this is Jurassic Park. Now, I know that Jurassic Park is the cliche pick, but I'll say, guys, it is a cliche pick for a reason. It is an absolutely incredible book. You know, the movie just hit 30, 30th anniversary, you know, this week. Uh, with me in this book, I think go back to thinking about when I first read this book, I was so blown away by it that I could not believe what I was reading. I didn't know that sci-fi could be this fun. Yes, I consider it sci-fi. I mean, it's a techno thriller, but I consider it sci-fi because, you know, read the book. You'll see why. But it's 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 different enough from the movie where I feel like it's like The Shining and that I feel like the movie and the book are both really, really good. But this book is almost borderline horror with some of the things because you think about what's going on here. Dinosaurs can eat man really, really easily. That could get uh, very, very horrific, I think. But Mr. Crichton, what I've always found fascinating about him is he would find ways to present an idea of technology or science and say, it's right there. Mankind could reach out and grab that. But he asked the important question of, should we though? Should we reach out and grab that? You know, dinosaurs, uh, you know, natural selection selected them for extinction, like Ian Malcolm would say, and they blew it, you know? So it was like, should we play God? Should we bring them back? Yes, you know, we, we asked, we said we could do it, but we never bothered to ask if we should. And that's the things that Michael Crichton always does. And with Jurassic Park, guys, it is just a banger. So if you love the movie, you never read the book, do yourself a favor, treat the book like the director's cut, if you will, because it is very, very different, I think. But it has a lot of the same ideas and themes behind it that you knew and loved from that movie. Absolutely stunning book. Number six, guys, maybe the greatest coming-of-age story of all time. I'm talking about To Kill a Mockingbird by Miss Harper Lee. This is one of those that they made us read in school. And <laughs> here's the thing, is we had like a, a list of five books to pick. And I remember I had wanted to read The Crystal Cave. Uh, I can't remember the, the, I can't remember the author, but it was an Arthurian legend book. And I wanted to read that, but it was all gone. So I had to settle for To Kill a Mockingbird. And they made this assignment list, and they said, hey, you guys have to read, you know, two chapters a week over the course of the semester. I read the whole thing that Friday night after school. <laughs> it was so damn good. So this, guys, again, one of the most incredible coming-of-age stories of all time. I think what I like about this is the adults treated the kids like adults. They never really treated them like they were kids. And reading this as a young teenager, that was something that really, really clicked with me. I love that, that the adults treated the kids like they were adults. They really respected what they had to say. And it never really ever made them seem like they were, oh, you'll, you sweet summer child, you'll just understand one day. It really respected those kids, and I love that. And it was really a, a very empowering book, I think. And it's just one of those books, I think, that uh, you go back and you'll look at it and you'll just think about that journey and you'll miss those characters and you'll just want to start over as soon as you finish reading it, guys. Again, the best, I mean, coming of age, guys, for me, right here, it's the best. It can't be beat. That's my favorite little subgenre in all of fiction. And this is the best in that genre. Pick it up if you haven't. I, I don't understand that people are like, oh, they made us read it in school and I hated it. I'm like, how? How did you hate it? Such such an amazing, amazing book. Number five, headed back to science fiction here. This is one that uh, is, which should be no surprise, I think, if you've watched the channel because I reference it quite frequently that every sci-fi book I read just about, I wish that it was more of this book here. This, of course, is Ender's Game by Mr. Orson Scott Card. Guys, Ender's Game, I think, is one of the most amazing books because it teaches you valuable lessons like teamwork, uh, I think with leadership, things like that, overcoming incredible odds, uh, looking at things of uh, you know through the eyes of a child that is thrust into adulthood so quick. So you have your own little coming of age in here that these kids are thrust into leaving their childhood and becoming adults at a very, very young age because of this future that we're living in. So this book, guys, here, right? There's a reason that this book is still given out in, in business courses. Like I, I took business school when in my late 30s, guys, and they were still talking about this book. They were assigning stuff from this book. The Marines, the United States Marine Corps, still issues this book. It's not mandatory reading, but they issue this book to all their cadets. That's amazing because this book does have all the stuff, military structure, chain of command, operational tactics. Dude, this, this book has everything. It's amazing. It's such a small book. And there's so many things that I feel like Card was ahead of the curve on, especially when it was like, you know, Know, how uh, posting on the internet can influence things. That's something that's like, wow, this really, <laughs> this really feels like he was ahead of his time in that regard. And guys, that's just an incredible book. You will read it in a couple of sittings. It really doesn't take long. Haven't read any of the sequels. That's something a lot of people jump on before. I haven't read any of the sequels. I love it so much, and I've heard the sequels are very divisive. I don't want to taint the legacy of that book at all because it's it's just oh so good, and I, I think you'll love it. Another one that I don't think you have to be into science fiction to really like it. 
Moving along to the second half here, guys, we're going to do something that no one would probably expect from me. That would be a historical fiction book, but maybe a romance book? I'm talking about Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. This is a book that everybody is like shocked when they hear me say that I like. They, oh, Mike, this big sci-fi fantasy horror guy. Surely he doesn't like a book about, you know, reconstruction after the Civil War and romance, right? This book is everything I think that you want in a historical fiction book. It's got action, it's got love, it's got revenge, it's got betrayal, it's got war, it's got disaster, it's got betrayal, it's got overcoming incredible odds. It has maybe the greatest love story ever put in fiction, guys. This book is absolutely incredible and I feel like it doesn't get enough attention because people hear things about it and they make assumptions about it. Like I said when I reviewed Lonesome Dove, guys, there are things in 1865 America might be a little different than they are in the world today. That's just the way that the world was. So I don't look down at those things and say, oh, well, it's bad because of this. This was a snapshot of time of America at its lowest point in its history. You know, So of course you're going to have those warts and all. But what I love about this, guys, is she actually writes a protagonist that you love to hate. You cannot stand her. And people are like, that sounds like a bad thing, Mike. Yet she gets stuff done. And something that is a weakness of mine is I love it when someone works hard. I love it when my characters work hard and they overcome, they do what people say they cannot do. She is absolutely amazing. I love her to death. I love her, I hate her, I can't stand her. I want to follow her. She's absolutely amazing. I am Rhett Butler and that like, oh my God, this woman drives me crazy, but I can't tame her and I absolutely adore her. So it's, it's an amazing book, guys. I think it's one of those that you owe it to yourself to read it because it is a classic in every regard. Sure, there's gonna be some things that make you uncomfortable. I mean, there's things in a Mark Twain book that are gonna make you uncomfortable. It doesn't mean you shouldn't read it. I think, again, you just gotta remember, this is a snapshot in time of the way the world was at the time. So I never really looked down on those things. But that book, guys, is absolutely amazing. I'm gonna be rereading it with some of my patrons here in uh, in July, and I'm excited to do it, because I've already read it twice. And guys, that's, that's even longer than Lonesome Duff. That's a long, long book. That's how much I love it. That I have just recently said, I'm dropping all the rereads. But I'm going to be reading this 400,000 word book again for the third time, Gone with the Wind. Absolutely incredible, incredible book. So I hear you saying right now, Mike, uh, where's the fantasy? Why don't you have any fantasy on here? Well, your wait is over, my friend, because one does not simply walk into Mordor. How do you pick one J.R.R. Tolkien book? It's very, very hard for me. It's very, very hard because I feel like the Hobbit, I, I liked it more when I was younger. I still love it. I still love it, guys. Don't misunderstand me. But when I read Lord of the Rings, I was like, okay, this this feels like my thing. You know, I'm, I'm grown up now. These characters are grown up. Tolkien feels like a more grown up writer. He's talking to a grown up audience. So, of course, it was going to come down to the trilogy for me. But which one? For me, it was very, very hard, guys. I went with, I went with Fellowship of the Ring. And the reason I'm going with Fellowship of the Ring is because I love beginnings. I love introductions. I love the way that Mr. Tolkien sets up this world, how he whisks you away from reality and you feel like you're in Middle Earth because of the way that he describes everything. He's describing this culture of the hobbits. And I'm like, oh my God, that sounds like something I want to do. I want to sit around and smoke and drink and eat and sleep all day and read books. This sounds absolutely incredible. And then he thrusts you into the muck. And you see, wow, it's a, it's a big, big world out there when you go on an adventure and things come at you quick. And I think I just, I, I love that journey, you know, of a fellowship coming together, making journey, people from all different cultures, cultures and lands and belief systems coming together, working together, forming a bond, a brotherhood, and literally going into hell and back with one another. Now, yes, it is part one of a three-part story, but again, you're making me pick one. I'm going to pick fellowship for that reason. I love beginnings, and I love that slow building bond that these characters do have while you've got that looming threat that shadowy presence in the background the whole time that does come to a culmination in the climax of Fellowship of the Ring. So, uh, guys, I mean, what more can I say about Lord of the Rings that I haven't? It's, it's absolutely amazing. The hardest thing to, to think about putting it on this list is which one book to pick. So that's why I always say that people are always going to say, yeah, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, that's one of my five favorite books. I'm picking just one, guys, and that is The Fellowship of the Ring. How about another fantasy one, guys? Because I know... Most people probably know, if you guys are everyday watchers of this channel, you watch every video I make, you've probably got the top three figured out by now. But for those who are new here, you might have some surprises, and I want to explain them. I feel like this series gets so much hate for one particular reason, and that is that it's not done. But you can't deny, guys, that A Storm of Swords is the greatest fantasy book that has ever been written. This is book number three in The Song of Ice and Fire. This book has 
everything. This book is about as long as Gone with the Wind, and there is not a single page that I would remove from it. It could have been 500 pages longer, and I still would have been loving it. This is the whole reason I feel like I think Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons are incredible books. But this book was so amazing. It set the bar so high that people were like, ah, those were okay. But you go back and read them now. You're like, yeah, they're, they're really freaking good books. This book has everything you want in a fantasy story. Everything. All those threads that he put in books one and two, which are five-star books in their own regard, and he blew them away with this. So many threads come all the way. You've got character redemption. You've got these arcs that started in book one. And characters that he you said, George, there is no way you can redeem that character. And he does it in this book. And he makes you be like, I don't even know what I believe anymore. He writes the most amazing, morally great characters I've ever seen. And I think that because it was the series that I cut my teeth on when it came to that. I had only read Tolkien before I read this. So this was the first one where I was like, wow, these characters, not only can they die, people think it's just great series because it's, it's shocking because characters died. It was more that these characters act like characters in the real world. These aren't like fairy tale characters. They're making decisions that real people would make. And it's not always the right decision. It's not always the good and morally straight decision. And that was something that really, really resonated with me. But as far as A Storm of Swords goes, it just has the most amazing climax in that book because it has like seven of them. <laughs> and it's just such an incredible story. It did right and just never, ever slows down. You've got scenes where it's just literally one character talking to another at a table and you can't stop reading because it's so, so gripping. So that was George at the absolute peak of his powers. The guy was untouchable. I still think that he is after that. Hopefully he will be again. But I really feel like the only reason that people put that series down is because it's not finished. But guys, you cannot deny the greatness that was there. I was angry at George for a long time too. I really, really was. Because guys, I've been reading this series since the year 2000. So yes, I'm very, very annoyed and frustrated by things. I even became jaded for a while. But the one thing I can't deny, five books that we got are absolutely smashers. And Storm of Swords is the best of that lot. It's an incredible, incredible story, guys. Please, please forget what you've heard. Forget about the TV show. Read the books. I think that you will actually love them quite a bit. You know what? You're upset that it's not finished. Just read the first three. I think you'll be quite happy if you just read the first three. Okay, guys, number two. We got the first horror entry on this list here. And again, I think this will be no surprise because Stephen King is my favorite author of all time that I would have a horror book on here. And that's who it would be by, the master of horror himself. And you want to talk about the peak of his powers, guys. I think it was in the year, was it 1986 or 1987? I can't recall exactly right now. But guys, this is it. It is the most incredible coming of age story ever not named To Kill a Mockingbird. And what I mean by that is because, guys, this has seven coming-of-age stories in it. And that's what I think is absolutely beautiful about it. And then, not only does it do that, then he revisits them when they're adults. And they're kind of flashing back between when they're adults, when they're kids, when they're adults, when they're kids. So you're seeing these two encounters they're having with this absolutely nightmare situation. And you see these characters, they go through hell together twice. Twice they go through this together. And it just makes an incredible, incredible friendship story. The Losers Club will forever be like uh, my Rat Pack. That's like my group that I think of when I think about that group of childhood friends who came back together when they were adults and it was like not a day went by. You know, but there are all, there are mystical forces and stuff like that and work in it. And yes, guys, it's very, very scary. But there's so many themes in that book that are scary in that you look at the story and you think, okay, eight foot tall killer clown, raise your sharp teeth, wants to eat you. Of course, that's scary, right? Somehow he keeps the focus on, yes, but it's the humans that are the real monsters in this story. Because you look at all these kids' home lives, and it's absolutely terrifying. It's just awful. And King always writes damaged characters so great. He writes little quirks for them, like, like how Bill has a stutter and he's working through that. Little things. Eddie has asthma. You know, It's just so many things that are just so, so amazing that he does with his characters and connects them to other works, obviously. But to me... That was just a book that when I first read it for the first time, I could not stop reading it. It was the biggest book I'd ever read in my life up to that point, and I never wanted it to end. And what's truly magical about it is I read it as a teenager. I really, really liked the kids part. I thought the adult part was okay. Read it again in my late 30s after I had kids. 
love both parts. Thought they were both. It was nostalgic. It was nostalgic for the for the kid parts and being like, I can see where these adults are coming from at this point now. So I think that's what makes uh, Stephen King such a dark wizard is the rereads. If you read this stuff when you were younger and you read it again as an adult after you've had some real real life experience, it's really going to hit you and it's going to hit you hard, guys. So uh, that's it, right? I don't. Oh wait, I do have a number one left, right? Again, like I said, guys, if you if you know anything about me, if you talk to me, if you interact with me, if you found this channel all before, you know that my favorite book of all time is Dune by Frank Herbert. No, I don't think it'll ever be topped because I think this book was instrumental in forming the person that I became. And I know that sounds overly dramatic. You'll hear people all the time say stuff like, oh, yeah, that book changed my life. And you ask them why and they can't really explain it. I don't know exactly that I can explain why. I can kind of tell you that when I was 15 years old, I had just moved to a new city here. I didn't know anybody. I felt very alone, very solitary. I was lonely. I had no direction in life. Uh, I was being raised by a single parent and she was always working. So I was a very, very lonely life and I had no real direction, no confidence, no self-esteem. I was scared of everything. I didn't know where my life was headed. And then I read Dune and believe it or not, it actually just completely changed my whole worldview. It changed how I looked at everything it helped me believe in overcoming fear and and becoming that man that you know no one thinks that you're going to be able to become embracing life you know just looking at things through a different lens opening that third eye if you will i think it helps that i was the same age as the protagonist when i was reading this book but that wasn't the only reason why it was just a lot of things that he was going through you know it, it, he's, he's lost his, he's lost a parent and he's having to come into these great responsibilities and trying to overcome that and, and, and live through that and try to understand his place in the world. And fear is the mind killer is just a mantra that really, really clicked for me. But the biggest, biggest theme is I think you're so, so confused at that age about the world. You know, you really have no idea except what your parents have told you. And what Frank taught me is something that I've really kind of stuck with in this book is don't blindly trust leaders. That's something that I think is just so... Like you'll see all the time, like, oh, I support this thing. I support that thing. No questions asked because everyone else says that I should do it. Whereas Frank puts out those big questions and says, you should not blindly trust any messianic figure whatsoever. And that was something that really, really resonated with me. And that's why I've always kind of been, you know, kind of standalone on an island on a lot of these things that people have strong, strong opinions about. And it's why also why I keep a lot of them to myself, you know, because I have my belief system and I think everybody else has their own belief system. And you know what? I'm okay with them having that different belief system. I know it sounds really weird to say that you got that from this book, but guys, if you read it at the perfect time, when your mind is still forming the person that you're going to be, it can have that kind of impact on you. And that kind of impact it did have on me all the way back then guys i have read this book 13 times and i'm not making that number up 13 times the baker's dozen and it just gets better every time i always find something new to talk about with it and i'll probably be talking about the sequels eventually on the channel because i know there are a lot of people that are more interested now that they've watched the new movie and they've read the book and they're like well i've heard a lot of things about the sequels do you think maybe i should continue with those yes i think you should but i have a little caveat here and there. But guys, that is my top 10 books of all time. I know many of you are probably very disappointed you didn't find your favorite author on here. Like I said, it's very, very hard. You guys don't know how much I struggled with this list. Uh, when I first jotted it down, I had over 30 books to kind of narrow down. And then when I finally was able to get it down to 10, it was what order do I put them in? You know, I knew my one, two were locked. Where was I going from there? But uh, I have to say, I'm actually quite impressed personally because uh, I, I, I didn't really fall into that trap of, of one genre. I've got six different genres on here, guys. I got four sci-fi books, one Western book, one historical fiction book, one horror book, two fantasy books, and one coming of age. I think they call it Southern Gothic. It's what they call it, Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of that. I feel like I, I, I do say that I'm really just sci-fi, fantasy, horror here, but I do like to step outside my comfort zone every once in a while and try new things. You know, but 60% uh, you know, of the list here is, or 70% is sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, and there's a couple other things sprinkled in here. But I, I'm very, very proud of that, that I feel like I've moved around in the genres enough to say I can have that much variety in my top 10 books of all time. Guys, lots of tough cuts. Lots of, I'll go ahead and tell you, number 11 was Count of Monte Cristo, okay? So it was a very, very tough cuts for me to make on this list. It was very, very hard to do it. And I hope that you can understand if I don't have your favorite book on here, hey, maybe I haven't read it. Or, you know, sometimes it's really, really hard when you talk about the 10 that really affected you the most in your life to kind of make other people understand why those are the most important to you. But I would love to hear 
what are the most important to you guys? What are some of your favorite books of all time? Have you read any of these? What do you think about them? Do you hate them? Do you love them? That's all good for me to talk about down below. I would love to hear some of your favorite books. If you want to drop your top 10, I would love to hear that much more than why my list sucks, but it is what it is, guys. This is the internet, but hey, I want you guys to have an awesome week, and thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to you down below.